in San Jacinto River, east of Channel View. Trees and homes are engulfed. Residents and nearby refinery workers flee the fast-moving flames. Hello, everybody. Just yesterday, we were talking about floods. Today, it is fire of the most unimaginable sort in the Houston area. Just a few minutes ago, our eyewitness news crews have been fanning out all over the area. All of this began early this morning when a pipeline rush ruptured on the San Jacinto River, apparently hit by a floating mobile home. That spilled gasoline into the river. The gasoline ignited. Let's go right out to Wayne Dolcefino Fino now for the very latest on this, Wayne. Yeah, afternoon, folks. Uh, the latest is we've had a very strong rain shower in the last 15 minutes, and it seems to have done a pretty good job of at least knocking down uh, some of those, uh, some of that big, thick black smoke, maybe some of the flames, but the fire is still burning a good six and a half hours after it all started. I want to tell you what happened, when it happened, so let's go to pictures early this morning, if we can, of the fire along the river. Apparently around 9 o'clock, the folks who run Colonial Pipeline, which is the world's largest pipeline for petroleum products, got an indication that the pressure had dropped. Apparently a mobile home coming down river from the floodwaters apparently ruptured the pipeline. At some point later on, perhaps an hour later, there was an ignition source from somewhere. We don't know where, and it really doesn't matter because what happened was a huge, tremendous fire that streaked across the water in all directions from the gasoline that was being poured into the river. A barge caught on fire as well, and then the fire spread into a neighborhood of residential homes that had already been inundated by floodwaters. Eight or nine homes along River Road were literally destroyed. What was it like to be standing in the middle of an inferno? Well, Willard Ritchie lives on River Road. Let him tell you. Well, they burnt my boathouse up and blew the boat up and burnt the bulkhead and whatever up, you know, and uh, just before the explosion, I was down at the river and I, I got real dizzy. My head started spinning around. I, I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what, what it was. And I knew it just about overcome me. So I caught, I, uh, about that time that it exploded, Patsy Arnold's generator just blew up, you know, and uh, just right there, two houses down, blew up, then blew that away, and blew this, was just boom, 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 boom. What you did know. you think? Ah, well, I just knew it was some kind of fumes. And those fumes were absolutely incredible, I can tell you, as someone who was right there on River Road with the first sheriff's deputies that arrived. They were literally helpless. They were afraid to get into the water to even try to see if there were anyone in the homes because there was fire on the water, there was gasoline in the water, there were fires popping up on one side of the street. As we were watching, a fire popped up on a, another side of the street. Let's go back to the pictures of the fire because the original explosion was not the only explosion that occurred today. At about 2.45 this afternoon, a second pipeline ruptured from Colonial, we believe owned by Colonial. This pipeline contained fuel oil. What that did was create a tremendous amount of additional food for the fire that was already burning on the river. And right now, that fire continues to burn. These were pictures taken earlier this morning when it seemed like the entire world was on fire. Thick black smoke, as you can imagine, pouring into the sky. If you've ever seen the movie Apocalypse Now, you ever see them striking with napalm during the Vietnam War, that's what it looked like this morning. And the smell was absolutely incredible. As it stands now, firefighters are letting this thing burn. There really isn't anything else they can do. The folks from Colonial Pipeline who joined us a little while ago said they cannot tell us just how much product, they call it, is in the water, what the environmental damage will be, how long it will take to clean it up. We can also not tell folks who are out of their homes just how long they will be out of their homes because this is a very fluid situation. I will tell you that the good news is that the concern earlier this morning was that two barges loaded with cyanide would go up in flames as well. That was the major reason for the evacuation in addition to the smell of that toxic gasoline smoke. But it was the fear the cyanide would go and that would have created a tremendous uh, problem. That did not happen. The fire appears now to be contained in the area where the slick is. It is going to continue to burn, maybe for hours, maybe for days. We just don't know right now. Back to you, folks. All right, Wayne. Uh, one, of, one of the things we want to make sure that we do uh, as we talk about all of this is to not use gas and gasoline interchangeably. Uh, a couple of folks have called from the chemical companies down there and said, mm -hmm. this is gasoline. Do We do want to be very, very precise about that. That's right. Well, let's go live now to Sky Eye. Gina Gaston's been standing by there or flying by there all afternoon. Gina? Tom, I'm about a mile and a half up north of where Wayne Dolcefino was, and if you look down below me, you can still see some very thick 
gasoline floating on the San Jacinto River. Again, you can see the two areas that are burning. The one closest to me, though, is burning very sparsely now compared to an hour ago when we came on the air at 4 o'clock. There were very thick, roaring flames shooting up maybe 50 yards high. Now we don't see any huge flames on this first oil slick burning up into the air, only some thick smoke. And then adjacent to it, that second bigger oil slick, that's the one that has been burning since early this morning that we've been watching. And between the two, we can still see a little bit of water shooting up. We notice that come up about 345 or so, some water shooting from the uh, water there from the San Jacinto River there. We're not sure whether or not that's some kind of line that's being used to flush out the pipes or what. That's just something we noticed like I said, the last hour and a half or so. The Coast Guard had been here up until about five minutes ago. They apparently came out with a chopper that had infrared, infrared capabilities, and you can barely see perhaps a gray chopper going by. There it is now. That apparently is owned by Colonial, the company whose pipeline burst and at least is responsible for one of these gasoline spills. Again, we're certain about the first, the second one, they were checking to see whether or not, in fact, it was their line that ruptured. But right now, as you can see, the wind has shifted. It's coming more toward our direction, although we are obviously staying out of it. But if, if the wind were to shift 90 degrees, then both the smoke and the flames that have at times been moving along the water would be moving toward homes. We assume, though, that those homes are evacuated since they are surrounded by water. I am Gina Gaston reporting live over the San Jacinto River and Sky 13. All right, thank you very much, Gina. Uh, Elma Barrera was also one of the very first reporters on the scene and had a chance to talk with one of the eyewitnesses there a little bit earlier. Elma? Exactly, and uh, just uh, so that you might remember, yesterday I was here all day long, just a few hundred feet uh, down. I'm on Sheldon Road right now, but yesterday I was at I-10 and the San Jacinto River. I met a lot of people who live along the river who were so happy to have been able to save a few of their possessions. And today I talked to some of those same people, and those few possessions that they ha have left, they are gone. Now I I want you to see the tape of uh, Blackie and uh, Juanel Crocker. They had saved a little bit. Their house was up on stilts, right on the river, right where the explosion happened, or near where the explosion happened. And they told me, they were anxious, of course, to say, we have nothing left except what's on our back. But they also told me about how they saw the explosion. It sounded like we throw liquid gas onto a burning fire at first. And then it was a chain reaction, running right straight on down. And uh, I felt the heat on my face, and I backed up in the big cloud of smoke. And I, had a, I heard a big explosion, a big boom. And I went to the door, and all I could see was the smoke going up in a funnel. And I'm screaming at Blackie, because he's across the street at Tommy Arnold's house. And I'm screaming, get across. And I thought it was a, a tornado coming. And Mr. and Mrs. Crocker, of course, were very concerned about their children. Their children don't live on the river, but they said, I know that our children are looking for us, and I know that they're very worried. By this time, they probably have contacted their parents, but just in case, your parents are alive and safe. Back to you in the studio. Okay. All right, an amazing story once again. Incredible that more people were not hurt in That's all right. of this. So far, we know that 59 people have been injured in this fire and explosion. Eight people treated for smoke inhalation, we are told, at Sunbelt Regional Hospital. One person was treated there for second degree degree burns and then 50 people were treated for smoke inhalation at San Jacinto Methodist Hospital. Authorities there have told us people came in complaining of burning lungs, burning, burning eyes, eyes, nasal exactly problems, right. respiratory problems. We want to go now to the Weather Center and find out from Ed Brandon what's going on now. We heard just a few minutes ago that there were at least a few showers along that way. Ed, what's it looking like now? What it's looking like now, Melanie, is that there are scattered showers and we're talking about isolated rainfall in southeast Texas this afternoon. We've had reports from uh, around the Galveston Bay area of some very light rainfall. Some of the cells are actually too small to show up on this radar display. You can see one there forming up to the northwest, actually appearing and then disappearing. That means in that particular rain shower, it started raining, rained for about 15, 20 minutes and then stopped. Now, in some areas of town, we have had reports of rain showers that 
that lasted as much as an hour. But with scattered, uh, pretty isolated rain showers like this, you're not going to get heavy accumulations of rain. All day we've been seeing precipitation out in the northwestern Gulf of Mexico, and there is still some. It's south of Galveston Island and moving toward the east. We're watching some rain showers develop around College Station, and those have something to do with a small front that is uh, well to the northwest of us, but could get closer to us tomorrow. And when it gets closer to us tomorrow, it's not going to be good news. The National Weather Service is saying that there is a possibility of some heavy rains during the day tomorrow. They're expressing the probability at 50% for metropolitan Houston, for that matter, for all of southeast Texas. That's possibly bad news, but the good news is, in this case, it will not be the same weather mechanism that brought the sustained uh, train ride of rainfall throughout southeast Texas a couple of days ago. These should be uh, fairly fast moving but heavy rain showers. At the present time, the uh, National Weather Service is saying the possibility of a half to an inch and in some isolated areas, two inches of rainfall tomorrow. Of course, for the areas that are flooded, that's uh, two inches more rainfall than they need. We'll continue to keep uh, an eye on this and have the complete forecast later. Tom and Melody. All right, Ed, I guess that is not good news for an awful lot of folks out there who feel like they can't quite get off this disaster train right now. We have had some improvements in the traffic this afternoon, and let's check on the latest with that. Here's Doug Brown. We might want to give Doug. Obviously a few mic problems. We're going to go ahead and straighten those out. But for now, why don't we take a quick break and we'll be right back. One, two, three, one, two, three. Yeah, it's fine. All right. So ask. Um, Go back to him. Folks in Liberty who just heard Ed Brandon's prediction of possibly heavy rains for tomorrow will not appreciate that prediction at all. That's exactly right. And we've almost forgotten in all the excitement today about the, uh, the, the effect of the floods over the last couple of days and how it's hit a lot of folks. Trinity River, always an area we want to watch closely, and that's where we join now our Liz Exon, who is live along the Trinity River in Liberty County. 
No, actually, I'll have to correct you on that, Melanie. I am actually standing in Liberty proper. We're at Main Street in Liberty, a Main Street that you can now see is underwater. You're looking at the Jefferson Square Shopping Center. It is underwater. You're seeing some... Uh, a National Guard a truck bringing some evacuees out as we speak. We are about a mile away from uh, City Hall and the courthouse. That is still dry, but much of Liberty is underwater. We've actually witnessed this town flood today. This morning, they were uh, sandbagging Baptist Memorial Hospital. All the patients had already been evacuated, so had some nursing home patients living across the street. At 8.30, it was dry. But within two hours, the water started invading Liberty. And while flooding is common in Liberty County along the San Jacinto River, no one out here can remember Liberty proper, proper the county seat flooding. Many residents evacuated before the water got into their homes. However, 80 people living at a second nursing home in Liberty had to be evacuated. Ordinary citizens volunteered to help the National Guard lift the elderly, many in wheelchairs, some bedridden into military vehicles to be transported to safety. The population of Liberty is about 8,000, and it's estimated some 1,000 people, perhaps more, are affected. We're back out here live now. A little explanation for all this flooding, uh, flooding that has never occurred in the town of Liberty before. They told me that uh, they had some flooding here yesterday. It cleared out, but a main levee that usually protects them from the San Jacinto River flooding broke, and that's when the water started rising out here. We do have a lot of support personnel working in this area. You can see a Department of Public Safety state trooper out here, but we've seen the National Guard, the Army Reserves, the Coast Guard, the State Wildlife Service. They're all uh, on airboats. They're on other kind of boats. We've got heavy military equipment in here transporting the people out. A lot of community uh, support out here, but as we speak, the water is still rising. A lot of people affected here in Liberty. Reporting live, Liz Exon, 13 Eyewitness News. All right, Liz, thank you very much. I want to head now to an area that we've been watching very closely for the last couple of days, Kingwood, and my partner Alan Hemberger standing by live there. Alan? Good afternoon, Melanie and Tom. Perhaps the best news for Kingwood residents today is that Highway 59, the East Tex Freeway, is open at the San Jacinto River going in both directions. But uh, really, how do you get your life back to normal after a flood has taken over your home? For many Kingwood area residents today, they began the slow and agonizing task of cleaning up. Mops, brooms, squeegees put to work here at the home of Orrin and Marge Sharp with some welcome help from their neighbors. Next door, people pitched in to pull up some soggy carpeting. And take a look at this refrigerator. It shows the effects of two days of being underwater. Jim and Rose Skuggs slosh back into their home today for the first time. It got in the oven. No, well, it got in the bottom. It did. Oh, yes, you can see the water. Brand new appliances. Okay, much of it. seem to be up to the task here for sure. Now, well, let's uh, join uh, Stephen Govain, who's going to tell the story about Forest Cove. And first one, I, I want to say the, the uh, sheriff deputies here are discouraging sightseers, and some of the residents here with their firepower are certainly discouraging the looters. Alan, as you know, for the third straight day, Forest Cove behind me here is in deep water. There are obvious signs, though, that the water has gone down, but not enough yet to allow residents to return. Uh, on a tour of Forest Cove this morning, we could see that the water has dropped from the roof level to just below the eaves in most cases. We crawled inside a second-story window of one home with permission to photograph the damage inside. Uh, the water had been here that had been here for two days wrecked everything, and as you walk down a narrow hall, you see the stairs leading to the first floor and the water that is still at ceiling level below. See people hurting, and you know they're hurting, and you feel for them, but you just really can't understand the depth of that hurt until you have seen it and felt it yourself. And um, you always know that. You say you know that, but you don't. It's just there's no way to know until you've been there. And that's the story from Forest Cove. And Absolutely. Part of the story is uh, some of the people who weren't flooded out certainly lost power. HLNP is out here in force restoring power tonight. They've also got a barbecue going for the flood victims of Forest Cove. Back to you, Tom and Melanie. Okay, Alan all right, Stephen. Alan, your heart just breaks for all those folks out there having to deal with that. It certainly does. Let's turn to traffic now. Doug Brown giving us that for the latest on the road conditions. Doug? All right, Tom, before we get to that, I want to mention Ed just uh, peeked over my shoulder a moment ago and said those winds are south at about 9 to 13, so that's the situation right now. We'll get right to what has happened in terms of 
of uh, the uh, damage that came about, of course, the fire-related activity. So if we can go to that first graphic, this will give you some idea. I-10 is closed near Sheldon, and uh, the new Highway 90 has reopened from FM 2100 to Sheldon. It was closed earlier due to that explosion. Also in some fire-related activity uh, on the east side, we're going to continue right on with those graphics. I-10 eastbound is closed between the east belt and the Chambers County line. Traffic is detoured to the beltway. Now the westbound traffic is closed from FM 3180 and parts of old Highway 90 are definitely underwater at this time. Flood-related activity, Lynchburg Ferry is closed. The only access you're going to have to Baytown is Highway 225 to Highway 146 north through the Baytown Tunnel. Expect a one-hour delay. Traffic headed to the Baytown Tunnel on Highway 225 outbound is crawling from Battleground Road to Highway 146. Also, we can report to you that it is going to be a very busy night virtually everywhere, Tom and Melody. All right, certainly looks like it, Doug. Thanks very much. And more news coming up after this on Live at 5. back here on Live at 5 with the latest on that huge fire on the San Jacinto River. Let's go live to Don Cobos at Garth Road at I-10 in Baytown. Well, Melanie, as you can see, the fire is still uh, smoking behind us here. Uh, this is a command post that's being utilized by the Colonial Pipe Company that uh, owns the pipe that's uh, exploded and is on fire right now. And also working out of here is the DPS. They've had several helicopters. Gina Gaston referred to one of them. And uh, the helicopters have been flying in and out of here. And a couple hours ago, one of them went up and several investigators were on it and they had some conclusions when they touched down. A few minutes ago, a DPS helicopter took several officials from the state and federal government up over the site to survey the scene. 30 minutes later, when the chopper landed, Carl Nordstrand from the Texas Railroad Commission spoke to us about what he saw. Well, the water damage is the most uh, impressive thing about it, uh, but the um, gasoline, uh, you know, seems to be contained now. Uh, you see the sheen. And there uh, looks like a, a barge still burning along with uh, a residence. The sheen's pretty widespread, but I don't think there's any danger unless you have something that's or something flammable that gets in into the sheen. Yeah, like there's nothing flammable. There's nothing. I don't think there's any problem as long as the sheen is left alone. 